This time I'm going to ask that if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 2. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 10 through 19. Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. And as you're turning there, you may notice the title, or what I've entitled this morning's message, is something you may have heard at some point in your life, or maybe you've said it at some point in your life. I've entitled this message, Don't Make Me Turn This Car Around. Uh, I can tell you that it is not, thankfully, something that I heard much growing up, but there were times when it certainly was said. And it was often said because I was either doing something that I knew I ought not to do or I was acting up in some kind of way. You typically hear that phrase when children are doing that which they know they shouldn't be doing. You might be familiar with the scene where a parent's driving and the child is in the back seat and they might be kicking the back of the seat. You say, stop doing that. And they keep doing it. Stop doing that. And finally, you get to your breaking point. Don't make me turn this car around. You know, you might have been going somewhere where uh, it would have been enjoyable. You might have been going to uh, offer them some type of delight, if you will. You might have been going to get ice cream. You might have been going to the store. But nonetheless, a parent might say, enough is enough. Stop doing what you're doing. And in this particular text in Haggai 2, verses 10 through 19, we see God in many ways reminds his own people that enough is enough. Now we've looked at Haggai over the last several weeks and we've seen several realities. The people had failed to rebuild the temple. They had lived in their own houses that were being rebuilt, but they had failed to do that which they had returned specifically for. They had been given the permission to return to rebuild the temple and it had been years and nothing was going on. They stopped doing this. And now we know that God had chastised the people. He had reminded them that there was a purpose for their being there and God desired them to rebuild the temple. And they began doing so. And he gives them comfort knowing that while the temple may not be as grand as it once was, that it is going to serve a greater purpose in that salvation will be seen by those who would later arrive. Of course, we know that being Christ himself. But then we have these words from Haggai 2, starting in verse 10. God says through Haggai, it says, In the four and twenty-fourth day, or the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. Verse 13, Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work, excuse me, <clears throat> and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were, when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to, press, to the press fat for to draw out fifty vessels of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands, yet ye turned not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is seed, is the seed yet in the barn? 
Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. So we have a lot going on here. We have uh, essentially this reminder of God's law. God asks this question in verse 12 of Haggai 2. He says, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, no. And it's here that we must understand that I know that the, the King James English is quite difficult for, at least for me as I was studying it this week, it's, it's difficult to grasp as to what's going on here. And I want to read, if you will, uh, I'm going to read out of a different version of this text. This is coming from what is referred to as the Legacy Study Bible. And in it, uh, the, the way it's worded is as follows. Verse 12 says, If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, Will it become holy? And the priest answered, no. And what's being referred to here is actually out of the book of Leviticus 6. Turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus 6. We, in our Bible study, were just looking at this chapter a week or two ago. Uh, and in Leviticus 6, verses 25 and 27, God's law at this particular time had declared this to be the case. Leviticus 6, starting in verse 25, it says, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. So God's law, this is referring to the sin offering and the burnt offering that is being done. That They were to take this offering, it is to be killed in this specific place, and it is to be offered unto the Lord. And God declared in verse 27, whatever touches the flesh of this offering will be holy. This idea is of transmission. If you touch this, it will be holy. Now, God asks his people a, a very intricate question. He says, you know the law says that whatever touches this meat shall be holy. If you go back to Haggai 2 verse 12, he says, essentially to paraphrase it, if you put a piece of that sacrifice in your pocket, it will make the garb holy. That is what is understood. However, if your garb touches something, will it make that thing holy? And the idea here is no, of course not. God said whatever touches the meat will be considered holy, but whatever touches the thing that touched the meat is not to be considered holy. I know that that's a lot, this kind of word play, but the idea there is, stick with me if you will. If perchance one of you was to meet some very well-known individual, if you met a celebrity and you shook their hand, you know, you got to meet this person that you wanted to meet for the longest time, you shook their hand. So you could say to people for the rest of your life, I got to shake so-and-so's hand. I met them. Uh, we know many of people who will meet someone they, they adore or cherish. They'll say something kind of foolish, but they'll say, I'm never going to wash this hand again. Uh, you know <laughs> that idea. But if you meet someone who's famous, you shake their hand, you can say, I shook so-and-so's hand. But if I come along and I shake your hand, I can't say, I shook their hand too. Because if you shook their hand and I shook your hand, that means I shook their hand. <laughs> I know that again, it sounds quite foolish, but this is the idea God is trying to get to the people in this regard. He's getting this idea of just because, specifically when we look at this text and 
the text that is to come. Just because you are living in the Holy Land doesn't mean you're holy. Just because you are living around that temple doesn't make you holy. Just because you live in proximity with God doesn't make you holy. I live next door to this building. I live next door to the church facility. But that doesn't make me holier than anyone else. The neighbor who's right to my right, I'm not more holy than they are because of my proximity to the building of the church. No, holiness is not transmitted in that way. It comes very differently. So God is asking this question, and they answer correctly. You're not holy just because of this technicality. Matthew Henry puts it this way. He says, though the, the garment is made holy and a devoted thing that is not to be put to common use till it has been first washed in the holy place, yet it shall by no means transmit holiness to either meat or drink so as to make it the better to, the, to those that use it. I love how David Guzik puts it. Because when we think about, especially because of the fact that we've been going through uh, pandemics uh, over the last few years, we know this idea of transmission. We know that someone who has a virus can transmit it to someone else. David Guzik puts it this way. He says, living in the Holy Land and offering sacrifices would not make the people acceptable as long as they themselves were unclean through neglect of the house of the Lord. Since their exile to Babylon, the people of Israel focused on getting back to the promised land. In and of itself, this was not a bad focus. Yet it led to the thinking that once they made it back to the promised land, everything else would be good. Haggai reminded them that their presence in the promised land doesn't make everything they do holy. If the priorities of our heart are wrong, nothing we do is really holy to God. The idea here is God is reminding his people that just because you rebuild the temple, that doesn't make you holy. Just because you rebuild and do what God had declared for them to do doesn't mean that they are holy and they can live however they want to live. We as Christians ought to take this to heart greatly for the world would have us believe as long as you go to church you can live however you want to live just live how you live for Saturday night ask for forgiveness on Sunday start over all, all Monday live how you want that's not the desire that God has for us as we see not just here but in all types of places now Haggai is told to speak another almost rhetorical question in verse 13. If you look at Haggai 2 verse 13, God directs Haggai to say, it says, then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, speaking about that which he was referring to in the previous passage, shall it be unclean? And the priests answered and said, it shall be unclean. Now, if you will, turn with me to, book, to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 19, verse 11, and then again in verse 22. Numbers 19, verse 11. God had in his law declared that this was to be the case, considering anyone that would touch a dead body, according to the Old Testament law. Verse 11 of Numbers 19 says, He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean, seven days and this was I would say it's a good practice uh, nonetheless it was good practice back in the day I'd say it's good practice today if you are not a mortician it's probably not wise to if you stumble upon a deceased individual to touch them because you don't know why they died now in God's law they had declared uh, God had declared to the people at least in verse 11 and then again in verse 22 it goes on to say whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean and the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until even or evening
And the reason this is important, the reason why Haggai is being told to speak these words to the people goes back again to transmission. I can't make someone holy by simply bringing them in proximity to the body of Christ. But I can tell you transmission works the opposite way, typically we see. Transmission typically works mostly in one direction, and that is uh, David Guzik says that priests answered correctly, holiness is not contagious, but impurity is. A sick child cannot, kill, cannot catch healthiness by being in contact with a healthy child, but a healthy child can become sick. The principle of transmission really only works one way, far more than both ways. And the idea that we see here is God is declaring to the people, you can't just be holy by being in the Holy Land, but you can be unclean or sinful by your actions. That's what makes us unclean. That is what makes us sinful, is the actions that we partake in, seeking to be like the world, seeking to be like those who are in the wrong. God desires us to live not in sin, obviously, but to live in holiness. And that means we cannot, as Christians, live how we want to live when we leave this place today and live as the world lives and then expect God to view us as righteous or holy. Now, our righteousness comes from one place and one place alone. It's not by our works, but by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is found in him. However, though it is found in him, God does not give us a permission or a license to sin. Just because we've been forgiven of our sins does not mean God wants us to live in wickedness. And he's reminding the people in the Old Testament, I believe even to us today, we can learn this lesson here, that just because God allowed them to return to rebuild the temple, that's not what was going to keep them holy. That's not what was going to keep them well spiritually. What would keep them holy is obedience to the Lord. And to us today, we must take this to heart. We must obey what the Lord commands us. He commands us not to live like those around us. He commands us not to live like the world, but he commands us to live as Christ lived, to live yielding to the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a case in the New Testament in which we see a church that fails this test and is a great example to us today. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is writing, of course, to the church at Corinth. And I can tell you, some of you may have seen this post or this meme that was going around social media recently. I saw someone had posted that if Paul was alive today, America would definitely be getting at least one letter. Uh, uh, Corinth, I think, is one of those churches. Corinth is one that received many letters. We have two uh, that we have on record, but there is evidence that possibly he wrote to them at least another time because he references, I believe even in 1 Corinthians, he references the fact that he wrote to them earlier. This was a church that needed a lot of care, needed a lot of love and attention. Because if we compare them to the other churches that have been written to, compare, if you will, First and Second Corinthians to Ephesians or to Philippians. Ephesians and Philippians, their letter is more concise, a little bit smaller. But the Corinthians, they have a lot of things that have been written to them. And the reason being is because much of what is going on in Corinth at the time is pretty much how the culture is heading in Rome at the time. Corinth was one of those cities where things became fashionable, where especially sins became fashionable. And in 1 Corinthians 5, let's look at verses 1 and 2, and then verse 6 and 7. Paul writes to this church and says, verse 5, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1, it is reported commonly, 
that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So essentially, what's happening here is Paul is saying, it's reported, or I've gotten word, I've heard the truth, that there is one within your body who is sinning in a sexual way, who is fornicating, and he says, in a way that not even the Gentiles do. And that, uh, to us, may not sound that big of a deal, but coming from Paul, a Jew of Jews, if you will, if you look at Paul's writings about his own upbringing, he said uh, he was circumcised on the eighth day. You know, he's born under the right conditions. If anybody could say he is a Jew, it was him. He says, not even the Gentiles, not even the pagans, not even the heathens of the day live like this. And yet there's one in your church. Going on into the next verses six and seven. It says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Paul is saying here, there's a sin going on in the body that not even the pagans partake in. We know that this is a, a man who has taken, and says, his father's wife. Now, to my knowledge, it doesn't go into specifics as to whether that's his own mother. That's what I glean from the passage. Or his mother, stepmother. Nonetheless, it was viewed and is viewed, I would say, as a sinful thing. Paul uses this terminology in verse 6 about knowing that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that was part of our scripture reading this morning in Galatians 5 where Paul uses that phrase again. If you're baking a cake or you're baking any type of bread, if you leave out something like yeast or I believe baking soda, leaven, this bread is not going to rise much. It's going to be unleavened. It's going to be short or flat. And this, of course, was what was used in the Old Testament and what is used even in our own today, the Lord's Supper, communion. But a little bit of leaven, just a small amount, can change the outcome of that bread or bake, uh, baking product. It can change the size or density of a cake. In the same way, Paul reminds the church and God reminds us today that a little bit of sin can wreak a whole lot of havoc. We must, as believers, view sin in the way that the Old Testament believers viewed touching a dead body. It was not to be done under any circumstance. It would make you unclean. It would make you unright. You would have broken fellowship with the people and with God. In the same way, I believe we must look to sin and say, I should dare not by any means seek to do that which I know is wrong. Because even a little bit can ruin the whole batch. I want uh, this coming to mind. I heard an analogy or, or just a way of putting this image in your mind. If I was to bring to you a plate full of warm chocolate chip cookies, and I was to go around and try and, and serve them to you, and I was to say, it's free, I bake them, I want you to have one, you don't owe me anything, just enjoy it. And right before you were to put it in your mouth, and I, I said, there's a small catch. I put a little dirt in the mixing bowl before I made this. Uh, and there were some bugs in there, there was some grass in there. I, I put a little soil there, but don't worry about it, it's just a little bit. Do you think you would enjoy that cookie? Some of you might still take a bite, uh, and I would judge you for it probably. <laughs> I, I might hold that against you for the future. But if you knew that there was something that was off about that piece of food, you probably would say, it's not worth it. I know it's just a little bit, but it's unworth it. 
Now, in the analogy that I heard, it wasn't dirt. I tried to clean it up a little bit. Uh, this was a Sunday school uh, lesson that someone said it was something that their dog left behind, but I don't want to go that far. <laughs> None of you would eat that, that meal if you knew that there was something vile in it like that. In the same way, we ought to live looking at sin like this, saying, yes, it may benefit me in an in an earthly way or a worldly way in this way, but it's gonna do harm to my spirit. It's gonna do harm to my fellowship with God. I can't take that risk. I can't take that chance. Sin is not something that ought to be dealt with lightly. It ought not to be something that we say, well, I can just do it and ask for forgiveness later. That's not the attitude that we ought to have by any means. It ought to be, I must avoid this at all costs. Why? Because Christ paid too high a cost for me to look at sin and think, maybe it's worth it. You must remember, and one of my professors when I was in college, he, we had many different classes on all types of issues. And one of the, the classes we had, we were talking about temptation. How do we as Christians and future pastors and ministers, how do we fight temptation? What's some of the best ways to do it? And he gave us many different things that could be placed into our lives. But one of the most uh, memorable things that he spoke on was, he said, whenever I'm tempted to sin, one of the things that I like to do is I immediately try my best to picture Jesus Christ on the cross. I immediately try to, to picture him hanging with his nails in his hands and nails in his feet with a crown of thorns where he has been beaten and lashed, where he's been spit on, mocked. And I try to think of Christ's sacrifice and then I have to ask myself, is what I'm about to do worth that? Is it worth it compared to the sacrifice Christ gave? And I can tell you the answer is always the same. No, of course not. Christ died an agonizing death. He offered himself as an atonement so that we would not be slaves to sin any longer. We must treat this precious gift with great care, knowing that I can't live like I used to live. I must live for the glory of God. Now, when we think back to Haggai chapter 2, Let's go back there. Verse 14, Haggai chapter 2, verse 14. God speaks again through Haggai and says that this people, it says, then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, they're unclean. So is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. That which they offer there is unclean. He reminds the people, if you live in sin, then no matter what offering you bring, it's not going to be right. It's not going to be worthy in the eyes of the Lord. I love how G.K. Chesterton put it. He says, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. It's very, very to the point, but absolutely true. I can tell you this, uh, this past Friday, I had the great misfortune of thinking, okay, I need to go. I need an ingredient for this meal that I'm preparing. So I'm gonna go to the grocery store. And as I'm walking out the door, I hear the door close and I check my pocket and I say, I've locked myself out. And then I go over to where the hide a key is. And I realized several weeks ago, some of you remember I lost my keys in totality. Well, I had to use that key to get in the other time and I failed to put that key back. So both of my keys were inside the house. I had to stand in my carport uh, for a little while. I talked with uh, several individuals at the church, got some help to finally get into the church and wait for a locksmith. But while I was in the car port, I wasn't a vehicle. I wasn't by any means a car. And I can say just by being in this building, doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just by being here doesn't make you a believer. What makes you a believer 
is the faith that you carry with you, the faith in your own heart. We must understand that it is important that we make it an effort to live a holy life as God has called us to live. Again, that phrase, and I hadn't thought about it very often until this week. We call Israel, we call it the Holy Land. It's very synonymous. But the reality is, just being in Israel doesn't make you holy. Just being in that area doesn't make you any closer to God. There are many things you can visit that we can look back and say, well, God was working here in this physical place. You can go to places like uh, Jerusalem. You can go to places like Capernaum, Galilee, Nazareth. And God worked all these miracles here. But just being there doesn't make you holy. Just being in church doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a believer is that very reality of what you believe. And belief must always be proven by outward actions. What I believe must always affect what goes on in my life. We know the things that we believe ultimately define how we live. If I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sins and he has called me to live a holy life, then my life is not going to look like someone who doesn't believe that. Your life is not going to look like someone's life who doesn't believe in Christ. Christ desires true worship. And one of the things you must understand is these these realities of worship can be seen in the Old Testament as well as the New. I want to give three final pieces of text, if you will, to, to help us better understand what God desires. He doesn't want us to come into this building and give lip service. He doesn't want us to live our life merely trying to imitate what other Christians do. No, he wants us to imitate Christ himself. He doesn't want us just to try and look good to those around us and then when we're by ourselves live however we want to live. He wants us to live like Christ in people's presence and when we're by ourselves. Isaiah 1 tells us of God's great desire. Isaiah 1, verses 11 through 13, and then 16 and 17, say this. Isaiah 1, verse 11 says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. And skipping down to verse 16, it says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead. For the widow. What's happening here is something that Israel has done time and time and time again. And sadly, we as Christians can fall into this trap as well. We get so caught up on just going to worship or going to church that we fail to actually worship while we're there. God doesn't just want us in attendance. God didn't want just these burnt offerings with no heart behind it. God doesn't want lip service. He doesn't want us just giving offerings or giving uh, tithes, however you want to view it. He doesn't want us just giving without having a heart behind it. You can give all the money in the world, but if your heart isn't behind it, I don't see it as being something God views as an actual act of worship. If you look at it as something that is an obligation or something that you feel guilted into, that's not what God desires. God desires us to have a heart for worship. He wants us to not just worship in appearance only, but in our actions. That's why in verse 17 it says, learn to do well. Seek judgment. 
relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, fatherless plead for the widow. He's saying, you can bring all these sacrifices, but if you're not living a life that is dedicated to the Lord in between those sacrifices, what's the point? Psalm 51, our call to worship, goes back to that very idea as well. Psalm 51, 14, and 7, 14 through 17, David says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. And this is key, this verse here, verse 16. David makes it clear, and I believe this is absolutely the case when it comes to God. It says, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. Worship that isn't sincere is not worship. Worship that isn't truly dedicated on bringing glory to God. It's just, well, I went to church this week. I can check that off. That's not what God desires. In the end, when we have to stand before the Lord, God's not going to say, well, you attended church more Sundays than you didn't attend, so I guess you're good. That's not how this is going to go. It's not about your attendance or just making lip service. It's about being broken over our sin, being in awe of who God is. This is what worship is all about not just a checklist it's so much more i'll end with this last scripture romans 12 verse 1 paul says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice no longer in the new covenant do we have to offer physical sacrifices praise the lord but we do have to live for the glory of god just because Christ has died for our sins doesn't give us a license to go out and live like the world. God desires us to worship him by living a life that sacrifices itself to the person of God. That everything we do, everything we think, everything we say, everything we take part in ought to reflect back to God in a good way. We often talk about the commandment of taking the Lord's name in vain. And the reality there is, I believe certainly, I, I would not encourage you to physically use God's name in vain, but how often do we live in a way that takes God's name in vain? How often do the actions we partake in take his name in vain? We need to be very mindful of the fact that our life is to be lived for his glory and not in vain pursuit of sin. Our life is to be, as it goes on to say, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, and the term here, reasonable service, is in many versions translated, your act of worship. How you worship the Lord is not just on Sunday each week. How you worship the Lord is how you live Monday through Monday. How you worship the Lord is how you treat people as he's called you to treat them. How you pursue Christ as he's called you to pursue Christ. I'm not standing here this morning pointing a finger at you and saying I've got it all right and you need to get it correct. I'm right here with you. I am growing in my own faith as each of you are. But let us encourage one another, push one another urge one another towards a holy life, towards that narrow way, as Jesus calls it. That we not just ignore the sin in our lives, but instead let us deal with it, repent of it, turn from it, and seek to glorify Christ in all things. For this is what worship looks like, is living for the glory of God every single day. Let us pray that we take this seriously in our own pursuit. With that, let us pray.